Australian House by you slash Lucky G Boy. Hello everyone, my name is Luke and I'm French. I'm 26 years old and I currently live in Australia since May of 2019. I met my girlfriend Mina, who is Japanese origin, one month after my arrival in Australia on a strawberry farm where we both work. We worked over there for several months until the health crisis hit the planet. So, no more work on the farm. We have to find something else. At that time, we had two choices. To go back home, and we split up. Or stick together and try to get through this event on our own. And spoiler, we chose the second solution. We then decided to leave our seasonal job in the countryside to go into town trying to find a new job. Bingo! Good news for me! An employer has agreed to hire me to work on a local Australian football team. This employer will be named Kathy. Kathy explains to me that I can work for the football team, but that currently, because of the health crisis, a containment will be mandatory even if at this time, Australia is rather spared compared to Europe. Anyway, I'm hired, but I'm gonna have to wait until the lockdown passes and the football season resumes. So I explain that it tempts me, but it will be intense for Mina and me to remain unemployed during the confinement because we have to pay rent and food and etc. You should know that Kathy has a heart as big as Australia. Sensitive to our situation, she explains that she has a solution for us. She has a holiday home several kilometers from Brisbane that belonged to her father who is now in a retirement home where we could stay for free while confinement is in progress. At this time, I do not believe it too much. I tell myself that there is something fishy, but in front of the situation, I agree, because this is the best solution for us. We accepted this and moved into the house a few days later. Animal Crossing, Splatoon, MK, we enjoyed playing video games during this lockdown. Everything is going well. We feel a little lonely because this house is isolated in the countryside, but apart from that, we are well. We have a garden, etc., and all of this for free. I also point out that this house is like in the middle of nowhere. I just have a neighbor named John who takes care of horses, and I've been friends with him, and that's it. In this house... There is a main entrance door with a large fuzzy glass, so you can distinguish things through, and there is another wooden door behind the house that overlooks a veranda connected to the house. This house is a single story, so there are no floors and to finish, no curtains at the window except in the bedroom. The context is given, and the story begins now. Three or four weeks after I moved in, Kathy calls me with good news. I can go to work. First day of work, everything goes smoothly. I like what I do and very good atmosphere. The only problem is, we're still in Kathy's father's house, which is several miles from Brisbane, and I don't have a car. So I have an hour and a few trains to go and the same one to come back. But, like I said before, I have nothing to complain about. For the record, Mina was still looking for work. She wasn't as lucky as I was, so she was mostly at home while I'm working. Second day of work. Always at the top, 5pm. I'm about to finish my job when I get a call from Mina. She whispers, with a voice trembling. First second, I feel something's wrong. She was quite playing Animal Crossing on the couch when suddenly, she saw a silhouette through the blurred window of the main entrance door. Too small and too wide for me, or even John, 
and she understands it very quickly. She stares at this figure that is now motionless facing the front door. It is at that moment when she tries to get up to gently walk away from the door that this guy begins to frantically knock on the door. Her heart is racing. She doesn't know what to do. She tries to be as discreet as possible so this guy thinks that no one is there or will open it to him. She finally decides to hide in the wardrobe of the room because it is the only room where we cannot see what is happening from the outside. Snuggling between the hangers of our clothes and praying for him to let go, she suddenly remembers that there is a second door behind the house that is open and she doesn't know if it's locked or not. Courageous, she decides to rush through the house to reach the store and then during her run, she sees this guy sneaking past one of the windows of the kitchen. The conclusion? He goes around to check if there is a door at the back of the house. Panic, but already in her race, she decides to go to the end and try everything for the hole. She must close this door before he tries to open it. It is finally when she presses the latch that she hears the individual trying to push the door. Completely frightened, she goes back to hiding in this wardrobe and that's when she calls me. As I said earlier, I struggled a little to understand what she was saying to me on the phone because her voice trembled, but I immediately tried to calm her down so that I could have a clear information about what was going on. And after a minute, I asked her to focus on her breathing and listen to me. She calmly describes to me what happened, and my brain switches modes. I think, I have to go home as soon as possible while making sure that she is the least in danger. I ask her to stay in that closet and call the police and call me right back away until I get home. Finally, she decided to stay on the phone with me, which is not the best solution, I admit. She should have called the police, but I was in a state of total stress and the fact that having her on the phone in continuous reassured me. I order an Uber, who must have found me super weird. Besides, I kept asking him to go faster, even to pay more. After a few minutes that I am in my Uber, and always with Mina on the phone, she explains to me that she can't hear anything anymore. No one knocking on the door, or no one around the house. I don't advise her to move, but finally... She motivates herself to take a look out of the wardrobe to finally a few minutes later confirming to me that the silhouette is no longer visible behind the door and that no one seems to be around the house. I'm in front of my house now and I go to meet Mina and give her a big hug by explaining that I am here and that she has nothing to fear. 6 p.m. It's night at this time of year in Australia. I check the locks and try to pass the ideas by playing a game and watching anime. Big mistake. In my relief to rush to find out without problem, I have omitted a detail of the greatest importance. To check around the damn house. Why did I not check around the house? Now it's time for bed. 1 a.m. And the neighbor's horses wake me up and I hear the hoofs. Mina, still not really asleep, asks me what is this noise, and I answer that it's the neighbor's horses. 3 a.m. I hear three booms, someone knocks frantically at the door, and from behind this, shot. But, like, super strong, like he's halfway to breaking down the door. I can tell you that I discovered what adrenaline was at that time. I'm sure it's the same guy, and he's been trying to get into this house all along. Mina screams, and I start to tremble everywhere. I have this feeling of being paralyzed, but still having so much energy to spend. It's very strange. I get up from bed in order to barricade the back door and then call the cops. It is at this moment when I leave the room 
that I hear a deaf and metallic noise. Damn, he opened the damn back door. He's on the porch. So, there is only one last door with a poor wooden hold under the small space at the bottom of the door that separates us. And he's still determined to come inside. For me, and at this moment, it is sure he will enter. Shitty reflex, don't do that. This is a bad idea. I'm not much of a fighter, but with no choice, I get the biggest kitchen knife I have and I place myself in an angle that I have the best chance of catching by surprise when I enter. And I'm willing to use that knife to defend us, to defend Mina, who is paralyzed in bed. I'm so scared, but at the same time, so much confidence it's really very, very strange. When suddenly, in the midst of her millions of thoughts, Mina screams. Stop! Call the police! I look at her. She throws my phone at me and I think that instead of waiting without doing anything, maximizing my chances of staying safe while waiting for her behind the door, it's a good idea. So, always in the same position ready to defend myself, I call the police. The phone call must have lasted 40 seconds. The policeman on the phone understood directly that it was serious. He asked me the address and said that they were on their way. And at this moment, I find myself a little more relieved while staying on the lookout. This is where the individual starts mumbling, incomprehensible stuff which does not reassure me because to the noise that it makes, I tell myself that it is either a drunk or drug guy or a mental patient. He must have figured out that I call the cops, but he's still touching the handle and pushing the door. 310 I have never been happier to see flashing lights. The cops are here, four cops and one police dog. When I see them approaching the house, I hear noises behind the door. The individual seems to get scared and gives up. I hear the dog barking, the policeman screaming, and a man moaning. It was over. They neutralize the individual and get him into the car. One of the police officers remained to talk to us and take our side of the story and find out whether we wanted to file a complaint or not. He told us that there was a chance that this man was a rehab patient who'd run away. He also told us that he was not sure of anything at that time and that they will have to verify his identity. But eventually, we never heard from this or the police. There you go. Australia is a great place. I'm kidding. Despite that, we have wonderful moments here and nothing similar happened then. It's already way too long, so I'm done here, hoping that this moment of intense life captivated you. Peace, Luke and Mina. Time I almost got kidnapped or murdered by you slash Hiccups Capone. This happened when I was in high school, which was a long time ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than I remembered. I was female and 17, working at a flower and gift shop. It's nighttime and a man comes in, short, overweight, balding, around 40s, and creepy. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend. So, I offer a bouquet. Obviously, it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This was the first weird thing, as he came into a flower shop. Then... He goes into detail about how he hit her and asks me if I think he was right to do so. 
This was long ago, so I don't remember exactly what I said. But it was something along the lines of, Well, not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing and asks when I get off work. I dodge answering and he leaves. Nothing for six months. Then right before Valentine's Day, he walks in the door one minute before close. It was dark and from the outside, it looked like I was working alone as my co-worker, who was a female and 40 years old, was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something isn't right and everything felt not right. I then notice he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious he wanted it seen. I quickly scramble a note to my co-worker and said, He has a gun and handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she should call the cops. I shook my head no, as I felt like it would escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm as normal as I could, and hopefully not tip the situation into something more dangerous. He spends 15 minutes wandering around what was fairly a small shop. In retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my co-worker would leave, as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for pickup on Valentine's Day, which gives me his name and info for the police report that I'm sure is hell about to file. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of hundred-dollar bills, which he slowly thumbs through, as if looking for the right one which to pay for his forty-dollar order. I ask him if he wants a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with a Valentine's card. He replies, No, I don't feel like being inconspicuous tonight which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out his coat. He leaves, and we quickly lock the door and watch him sit in his truck outside. We are not about to exit the shop until he was gone. Finally, he pulls out of his parking spot and moves to another spot further away and continues to just sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom crying. She called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at that time what happened, and she told her mother. Her mother happened to work with a man and informed security at her job. She said he was very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job pulled him into the office and questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that his company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops' multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at that time, made me quit my job, which was devastating as I loved it there. In retrospect, totally the right call. Dude came in on Valentine's Day and picked up his order, and I never saw him again. Maybe escaped a serial killer last night by you slash Jenny J23. So, I live in Atlanta, and right now, we are having a moment. About a month ago, a woman walking her dog in or near Atlanta Central Park was stabbed and mutilated along with her pit bull. The brutality shocked the city to its core and has everyone on edge. Add to that, another young woman was followed home from a gas station after leaving work as a bartender and was kidnapped then murdered. 
This means we have a whole bunch of scared women in the city, too busy to hate. Anyway, I work very close to the park where the woman and her dog were killed, and I have been extra careful since it happened. But last night, I was working alone and I had scheduled a new client for a 5pm appointment, thinking that I'd be done by 7 or 7.15 at the latest. However, she needed some extra work done, so it was after 8.30 by that time, and I walked her outside to her car. We stood talking in the parking lot for a couple of minutes before she got into her car. Here, I should add that my parking lot is small and fairly secluded because of a large hedgerow and a retaining wall. After I made sure that she was safely in her car, I went back into the salon and locked the door behind me with the intention of cleaning and locking up. I was inside for less than 10 seconds. Before I turned around and saw a man pulling on the door, there had been no one in the parking lot that I could see and there were no other cars than mine and my client. This guy appeared from nowhere. As I said, I am already on edge, so I stood there for a second, not sure what to do. And he stood there staring at me with his hands on the door handle. Finally, I walked up to the door. It's a glass door, so I could see him and he could see me. And I said, What's up? I could see that he was surprised that I didn't just unlock and open the door and he stuttered a couple times before pointing at the hair product wall and saying, Uh, oh, I wanted to buy some of that makeup over there. Here I noticed, number one, he's got a pretty good black eye, and number two, he's wearing a fairly large surgical mask outside and alone, which made me think he was trying to hide his identity. I told him, That's not makeup. That's hair products because this is a hair salon and we're closed. Then I turned out all the lights at the front of the salon and walked towards the back wall to hit those lights as well. Once I had all the lights out, I could see him, but he could not see me. So I watched him because I didn't want to go right out after that. He ended up pacing back and forth by the front door for a couple of minutes, and then he walked to the upper part of the parking lot above the retaining wall and stood half behind a tree and bush. He would stare at the salon door, then crouch down, then walk away all nonchalant, then come back to his hiding spot and stare at the door again. After watching him do this about three times, I decided on the next time he walked away, I was going to make a run for my car. As soon as he turned his back and started walking towards the direction of the park, I ran out. I locked the door and sprinted the 20 feet to my car in a full-on panic. Thank God for Keyless entry. I had no idea what he was up to, or if he really was a serial killer. Probably not, probably just trying to rob me. But what I do know is that he definitely saw me in the parking lot talking to my client and I did not see him. I also know that if I had not locked the door, I would have had a much different night. There is no question in my mind that he was going to harm me in some way. As a side note, Lots of people have asked if maybe he was homeless. I absolutely do not think so. He was well dressed, his head was bit, and while he definitely scared the crap out of me, he did not give off the desperate vibe of a lot of the homeless, mentally ill, or addicted people that I've encountered in the past. Those people don't scare me really. Mostly, I feel sad for them and try to help in some way. But this guy had every alarm in my body screaming at full volume. 
be warned. If you are coming to the A right now, maybe don't? Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated, but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.